Welcome to Jewish History Soundbites Podcast with Yehuda Geber. Immerse yourself in the rich tapestry of Jewish history as we explore fascinating tales and uncover hidden gems from our glorious past. Brought to you by our proud sponsor, Cross River, a leader at the intersection of financial services and technology committed to empowering the communities they serve. Cross River's steadfast support fuels our mission to preserve our heritage and foster a vibrant future for all. Contact Cross River through their website at crossriver.com. A date which will live in infamy. Both of those projects, initiatives, got off the ground because of the Gare River. The 11 Olympic team members slain in West Germany. The Olympic Games. Look at how far the breeder in America. So count the shoppers at the ski Out of the 24 who were killed were Americans who had come to learn in heaven. I say one million Jewish children who were made to be cut in Lusa. Whoever heard such beautiful words, It is never too little, it is never too late, and it is never enough. Jewish History Soundbites, bringing alive the world of our glorious past. Here is our host, live from Jerusalem, Jewish historian and tour guide. Together with Jewish History you know Soundbites, and this episode is number nine in our ongoing series about the Great Shanghai Escape. If you haven't listened to our previous episodes in this series, you may want to do so. Check out the previous episode, previous eight episodes, installments in this series, as well as everything in our archive. You can get it on any podcast platform. If you have, in the unlikely event that you have any friends and family um, who are not yet listeners to Jewish History Soundbites, then uh, I'm not going to tell you not to be friends and family with them, but you should definitely encourage them to listen um, and spread the word about the podcast. I got great feedback from the previous episode with my good friend Davi Safir, So maybe we'll have him on again since uh, he seems to be quite popular with the listeners and especially all that historic audio that we were able to add that added a lot of flavor to to the podcast. I want to try also to start winding down with this series. Um, The main story, I, I believe, as far as my goals were concerned when I, uh, when I launched it, was to get, get them out, was to actually get them out of the Soviet Union, which we accomplished um, the last couple of episodes. Now I'm going to cover their time in Japan and try to get them to Shanghai. And then perhaps we'll have one more, just as like a grand finale after this, which will be cover their time in, briefly cover their time in Shanghai itself, um, and maybe even get them out of Shanghai. But the goal really was in the title of the series is The Great Shanghai Escape. Um, so the idea is is to get them out of of, uh, of the Soviet Union and to clarify much of the story which has been so far misunderstood and less so about their actual time in 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 Shanghai. So we'll get back to <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, we'll pick up their story in Japan um, and they arrive like we spoke about. They arrive in Japan and it quickly becomes evident that their um, that their their uh, goal or their supposed goal of getting to Curacao is not realistic. First of all, no one was really interested in getting to Curacao. Second of all, the practicality of it, of getting there once they got in Japan did not seem feasible. They had used the Curacao's uh, visas as a sort of fictitious end visa, and it was almost inherent from the beginning, at least by the refugees, the Jewish refugees applying for them, that it was. It was not really the goal. The goal was to get to the United States, to get to Palestine um, and for most people. And Curacao was just seen as a way to get some sort of end visa, which would enable them to exit the Soviet Union. So it became clear that Curacao wouldn't be an option. 
um, to as far as the refugees were concerned, as far as the Dutch were concerned, um, as far as Curacao, the practicality of reaching Curacao. The other, the other issue was they had only 10-day visas um, or two-week visas, whatever it was, um, as transit visas in Japan. Um, and the average refugee ultimately stayed in Japan sometimes for several months, um, eight, nine months even, some of them, some of them less, some of them actually it was only a few weeks, it depended on each person, what, what type of end destination they had. Um, but but uh, each one had a different one. And the Japanese government, incredibly enough, they uh, almost graciously, after all the kinds of interse- intercedings and, and stadlanus, I spoke about how Professor um, Stezo Katsuji, um, he, he helped with this, and Warhoftig and others, and perhaps we'll get into that a little bit more in this episode as well. Um, they were able to extend the refugees' transit visas in Japan for, like I said, from like two weeks to several months. Um, there were many attempts to immigrate to the United States. Um, that seemed to be a viable destination. Most refugees wanted to get there, at least temporarily, and it was right across the Pacific Ocean. So there should have been possible. The problem was that getting into the United States was quite a challenge. The immigration quotas that had been imposed and the very inflexibility of the State Department, the United States government, in allowing refugees in. Um, and uh, they weren't that excited about making any exceptions. There was a very, very rigid quota system, which is quite a story on its own merit. So there were those who made it there. Um and, uh, and and did make it to the United States, even from among the Mir group. Um, for instance, the, the Levavitz family, Rabbi Rucham's wife and her children, Rabbi Rucham's children, most of them, one of them, Rabbi Israel Levavitz, remained behind in Vilna, and he and his family got killed. Um, but the rest of the family, they did not go to Shanghai with the Mir. They uh, they got visas to the United States, or Barney Shai Shapiro, or Veli Chazan, uh, several others. Uh, they had They had, by one way or another, Chavitz Chaim's uh, second wife, Freda Kagan, and her two children, Rebetzin Zaks, Rebetzin Fagi Zaks, and her husband, Remendel Zaks, and her son, um, Aaron Kagan, um, and uh, and others, many others, Rabbi Aaron Cutler. Rabbi Aaron Cutler was another one who, um, in, in his his um, part of his family, at least, um, they, they went through Japan and made it straight to the United States. And there are, there are quite a few others like that. So there were... There were those who went that route, um, and many others attempted to do so t- as well. So the rest, they stay primarily in Kobe, like I mentioned last last time, and they receive funding from the joint. And the yeshiva students and the yeshiva community from Rabbi Avram Kalmanovich and the Vad Hatzala. There's correspondence at this point between Rabbi Leib Malin, who kind of is is uh, you know he's the leading student of the yeshiva, um, and he's almost the leader of the, the whole yeshiva, along with, of course, the Rosh Yeshiva of Chaim Shmuel Levitz, the Yeshiva of Blaise Yudel Finkel was in Eretz Yisrael, Palestine at this point. They were also with the Mashkiach, Reb Chatzke Levenstein was with them in Japan. Um, and Reb Leib Malin, there's quite a few letters between him and Reb Ram Kamenovich describing the situation, and it was rather dire at, 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 in the early stages. Reb Leib Malin describes in one of the letters about how the Koba Jewish community is trying everything they can do to help the refugees, but he says the numbers are just overwhelming. The, the Koba Jewish community is only about 27 families, whereas there's thousands and thousands of refugees, and they're simply overwhelmed, and they're not able to do uh, more uh, than, than they, they can. They're trying to do their utmost, and they did, the, the Koba Jewish community. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting, there was also correspondence with the Jewish communities in China, Eventually, they'll be connected to the Jewish community in Shanghai, but there was also a Jewish community in Harbin, also Russian Jews uh, primarily, although there were others as well. There was a famous Rav there, Rav Aram so they were a they were a a, a a a factor as well in this refugee story. Um, around midwinter, towards the end of the winter, is about January February 1941. Most of the Polish Jewish refugees. Uh, um, had made it to Shanghai. The Mir Yeshiva was firmly established in Kobe, Japan. They had uh, gotten themselves a building through the funding provided by Ravram Kalmanovich and the Vadatsala. 
and Professor Katsuji was assisting these refugees. He assisted specifically also the Mary Shiva. It's interesting, in, in, uh, in, um, in the spring, in Sivan, around Shavuos time that year, 1941, there was a gathering in Kobe, Japan, um, an Agurus Yisrael gathering, uh, commemorating the 29th anniversary of the Katowice Convention in 1912, which had established the Agudas Yisrael. Interesting that they, they you know, kept a political life going and they, they marked anniversaries in, in that summer um, in 1941. In August, the fifth day of, of 1941, was the first yard site of Reb Chaim Eiser Grudzinski, so the yeshiva community in Kobe, Japan. Um, they commemorated Reb Chaim Eiser's yard site. He was the the head of the head of everybody, uh, the whole the whole uh, yeshiva, not just the yeshiva world, the Torah world in general, the Orthodox world. So Reb Chatzka Levenstein, the Mashgiach the Yeshiva, and Reb Mordechai Rogov, who also didn't go to Shanghai, he ended up getting to the United States. I think he became a rebbe in um, in, in Skokie. Then it was in Skokie in uh, in uh, Hebrew Theological uh, College in Chicago. And later it moved to Skokie. I think Rabbi Wine told me he was his Rebbe. I have to double check that. It's not in my notes here in front of me. Just that if my memory serves me correctly. But either way, Ramat Ragov and Reb Chatzka Levenstein um, were, uh, they delivered Hespedim for Reb Chaim Eiser. So they had a active Jewish life in their time in Japan. They start also to confront anti-Semitism in Japan, which I discussed last time with Davi. Um, the stance of the Japanese government was complicated with the refugees. Um, the refugees, uh, the, the government, government, first of all, was the Japanese imperial government was very wary of Westerners in general, um, especially refugees. And uh, there was this, like I said, certain certain uh, elements of the Japanese government had bought into this anti-Semitism that was spreading in the media, and it was, of course, Nazi-influenced. On the other hand, they keep on extending their visas. They allow them to stay. So... There's this very ambivalent attitude that the government has, and this brings us to a very famous meeting um, with the Japanese foreign minister, Yosuke Matsuaka. I'm for sure mispronouncing that. Um, And other Japanese imperial officials. And the one who interpreted the, for for the Jewish uh, commission, or or the Jewish uh, representatives, was Professor uh, Katsuji, right, who later converted and became Avram Katsuji, 1959, I mentioned that. So he, 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 you know, he interprets for them, he's the go-between, and the Amshin of a Rebbe, Rabbi Shimon Shalom Kalish, and Ramesh Shatskis, the Lamjarov, by the way, Ramesh Shatskis was another one of those who made it straight to New York, did not go to Shanghai. Um, the Amshin of a Rebbe did not, he, he went to Shanghai. Um, he, and, and several others, there were a few other Rabbanim and, and communal representatives, uh, members of the Kobe Jewish community, who meet with the Japanese foreign minister, Yosuko Matsuaka. And um, and they try to explain the refugees' plight and ask for extension of their visas. And the Japanese government wants to know more about the Jewish refugees, wants to know more about what they, what, you know, leaving the Soviet Union and where they're planning on what their final destination is and what they plan on doing in Japan. And there's this, uh, you know, it's a culture clash. It's this two worlds, uh, Jewish, European, and Japanese imperialism, and, uh, and, and Professor Katsuji in the middle. There's all kinds of myths and legends about this meeting. It's very hard to separate legend from truth. Um, there's a story that goes that the foreign minister said that because the American philanthropist 40 years earlier, Jacob Schiff, had funded the Russo-Japanese War, um, that... Uh, that he had provided lots of funding, financing, and loans, and all kinds of stuff to the Japanese government in 1905 for them to fight the Russians. And the reason Jacob Schiff ostensibly did that was because, you know, the Russian Jews suffered under the Tsar. So anyone who's fighting the Tsar is good, because the Tsar is bad. So, because the Tsar is bad to the Jews. So he's funding the Japanese, to, to, so the Tsar should be beaten. And um, they were, actually. So maybe Jacob Schiff helped to help, assisted in that, and therefore Jews have this good memory, and and some people extend the story even further. And again, it's hard to separate truth from fiction over here, so I'm not vouching for any detail of this story, but I think the core of the story might be true, um, that uh, 
that the Japanese, as a result, kind of almost like in a good way, believed the, 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 the anti-Semitic propaganda. In other words, anti-Semitic propaganda, especially Nazi propaganda, and t- till today you have, unfortunately, elements of this, these tropes and propaganda uh, uh, promulgated and promoted in, in, in all kinds of cultures and countries, um, that the Jews control the world and they control finance and they, international uh, connections and conspiracies. So they said, look, Jacob Schiff, the Jew helping Russian Jews, financing the Japanese war uh, to beat the Tsar. So there you go. The Jews do control, but they control it in a great way. They help Japan. They're awesome. So so we like the Jews. So it's almost like they, if this is true, I don't know if it's so true, but if, if this detail would be true, then uh, it's almost like they believed the anti-Semitic propaganda in a good way. There's another legend, and again, it's hard to know how many details. I think it's exaggerated. That's my my understanding is that the Amshinava Rabbah came up with this very clever response to the foreign minister about why the Nazis have this racial anti-Semitism, this terrible uh, anti-Semitism towards the Jewish people. And he said, well, we're Oriental. Um, we come from you know, an Eastern culture, originally from, you know, from Palestine. So that's the Middle East or the Near East. The Far East would presumably fall under that category as well. So you know, he's like, all right, Oriental shouldn't be that bad. Because we're the Far East, so we're like, I don't know, even more Oriental or something like that. Um, it could be that, that that also happened. I'm I'm not 100% sure. Speaking of myths and, and all kinds of things like that, there's another story that I'm pretty sure never happened, but it's repeated quite often that um, I think it's said about Rabaran Cutler in Japan that since uh, em- the emperor, Emperor Hirohito, um, they, he was worshipped as a as a, kind of like a, a divinity. Um, that's true. That part is true. He was worshipped as a divinity, and and, and and you know you also look at the imperial uh, flag of Japan. It's the rising sun, um, and the sun is considered the god. So the emperor is is a descendant of the sun, um, and therefore he's divine as well. It has to do with the sun. So. There was all kinds of, you know, real, you know, pagan worship almost of, of the emperor and all the symbolism of what it represented. So there's this legend that Rabaran Cutler refused to bow down to the emperor or when he was passing by in the street or something. And he risked his life because the Japanese killed anyone who didn't bow down and, and, and he wouldn't because of the Zara and a whole thing like that. There's a few holes in the story, so I tend not to believe the story. But what, the reason it's funny is because there was once a... I don't know how many listeners of Jewish History Soundbites visit Japan ever. I never have been to Japan, although I would like to go one day. Um, but there was a listener of Jewish History Soundbites uh, several years ago, four or five years ago. It was a funny guy. And he uh, he sent a, a video of himself in Japan um, um, trying to imitate Yehuda Geber guiding... Um, as it, you know, if I would be guiding in Japan, what would it sound like? So he's walking down some main street in Kobe, Japan, and he says, "And here at this spot is where Rabaran Cutler didn't bow down and uh, and almost got killed because he was supposed to bow down to the emperor." And he was, you know, he sent me a video of that, and he thought it was pretty funny. So, you know, you can do that next vacation you go on. You can pull a Yehuda Geber and try to be a guide and make a video and. And maybe you'll get an honorable mention on the next uh, Jewish History Soundbites uh, podcast. Not more than that. I can't guarantee that there's going to be any other prizes for doing that. Um, in any event, there's also, um, we mentioned the Dateline controversy, um, which there's an entire episode of Jewish History Soundbites devoted to a few years ago. So you might want to check that out as well. That's another story that happens in Japan about which day to observe Shabbos and then later on also the Yom Taivim. But in the summer of 1941, the Japanese are now preparing for Pearl Harbor. And therefore, they want all Westerners out. They also want refugees out. Because refugees, it's very easy to infiltrate into a refugee community. And they were very concerned about espionage. That the Americans or the British would smuggle in in these groups of refugees. They would they would they would put in um, uh, uh, spies, and and they're they're they very worried about that. And since the operational stages of Pearl Harbor were being planned by the Navy at this point, um, they did not want any foreigners around. They didn't want foreigners by the ports where the Navy was preparing. Also. And therefore, they said in the summer, we have to clear everyone out so that we can go ahead by December, 
Actually, by the way, as I speak, it's um, it's it's Pearl Harbor Day. It will, it will by the time this is posted, it will presumably be after Pearl Harbor Day, or by the time you listen to it. But ironically, I just noticed that it is December seventh, nineteen forty-one, as I'm saying this. So uh, ironic. So they have to leave. And since the refugees couldn't, most of them, some of them made it to the United States, even fewer made it to Palestine, some made it to other destinations. For instance, our old friend Nathan Gutwirt, he was a Dutch national, he was trying to get to a Dutch colony, and Curaçao, again, wasn't feasible even for him. So he and a couple of other Dutch citizens, they went to another Dutch colony called the Dutch East, in- the, the Dutch East Indies, which today is known as Indonesia, after it gained its independence in the 1960s. Um, so the, the um, 1950s, I don't remember, could be 1950s. Um, so they, uh, uh, so he went to that colony. And when uh, when Dutch East Indies was overtaken by the Japanese during World War II, so all Westerners were arrested by the Japanese and kept in, and basically in like uh, camps and Probably officially prisoner of war camps, but they're pretty, uh, pretty problematic uh, situation. It's very interesting. Also, the Japanese were guilty of war crimes, serious war crimes. Uh, and if you talk about what they did to the Chinese and the rape of Nanking and mass murder and torture and extermination and awful, awful millions of Chinese uh, are cruelly either killed or die under the occupation by the Japanese. And then to others, to Koreans, and to all kinds of horrific crimes. And then also to the Americans and British during the war. To, they violated the Geneva Convention, and prisoners of war, the Bataan Death March, and, and other other uh, terrible tortures, and even executions of prisoners. And and they're tried for war crimes after the war, and they're really you know cruel, awful people in many ways. And all of a sudden, to these Jewish refugees coming in... You know, they didn't exterminate them. They did not put them in camps. They extended their visas. It's almost like they're different people. All of a sudden, they're big tzaddikim. It's it's such an, I find it to be a fascinating, fascinating story about this dichotomy of the Japanese attitude to the Chinese and to eventually after they declared war against Westerners, against, uh, against uh, Americans, British, even combat troops who were captured as prisoners of war. But to Polish Jewish refugees, no problem. I mean, no problem. Eventually, they put them into a Japanese into a ghetto in Shanghai, and you know, it wasn't easy, definitely. But you know, nothing comparable to how the Chinese suffered under the Japanese or America, even American uh, soldiers. Uh, very, very interesting. Um, so the Japanese decide to deport the Polish Jewish refugees or all refugees to Shanghai in the late summer early fall of 1941, around Elul time, if you want to go on the Jewish calendar. Um, And we'll get to that, but I want to wrap up a few more points about their time in Japan. First of all, there's a very important story that's overlooked um, that I think is completely unknown, not just overlooked. The story of the Polish ambassador to Tokyo, Um, a fellow by the name of Tadeusz Romer. And remember, Poland doesn't exist as a country anymore because it's occupied by the Nazis. Um, and um, even the eastern Poland at this point is occupied by the Nazis because June 22, 1941, Operation Barbarossa, the Nazis invade the Soviet Union, so the Soviet-occupied eastern Poland comes under Nazi control as well. Either way, there's a Polish government in exile in London, and they still maintain uh, diplomatic relations with countries around the world and their embassies, Polish embassies. So the Polish ambassador to Japan at this time is this guy Tadeusz Romer. And he, um, and most of the refugees are Polish citizens. And naturally, as citizens who need assistance, they're in a foreign country with a visa running out with no final destination to go to. Many of them naturally turn to their ambassador. They go to the embassy to Tadeusz Romer and they ask him for help. And he goes ahead well beyond the call of duty, and I think this is completely unknown, and just works day and night to help process hundreds and hundreds of Polish Jewish refugees as Polish citizens. And he lobbies other embassies, primarily the British embassy, um, but but even other ones, to allow them to get into those countries, to to Commonwealth countries, to Canada, to to, Canada. to Australia, very little success, but sometimes he was successful, especially regarding Canada. He did get some refugees in to Canada. 
He lobbied the Japanese government as the Polish ambassador to Japan. He lobbied the Japanese government to allow his Polish citizens to extend their visas in Japan and stay for longer. And he was also successful at that. He's one of the major players in that story that these Polish Jewish refugees were able to stay for months and months and months. So he and he assisted them in finding places to stay and 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 getting funding and you know they, they're able to get international funding sent through the embassy and diplomatic cables people needed to send to relatives and other things like that. He was incredibly helpful to the refugees and the refugee community and they actually saw him as as almost like a hero. Um, he, he was in Shanghai afterwards also and the, the reception for him there, Miri Shiva and other places, they, they, they treated him like this, this hero. He was like a, someone who treated them well during this time. That's one story that I want to mention. Another one is our old friends Zorach Varhaftig and Nathan Gutwirt and their activities assisting the refugees in Japan. Varhaftig arrives in Japan a couple of months before Varhaftig in, um, towards the end of 1940. Um, in the uh, end of 1940, beginning of 1941, um, Gutwirt is already there by, in, by December, so they're starting to work. And, Gut- and Varaftig, unlike most other refugees, stayed in a hotel in Yokohama, not in Kobe. And Varaftig would come to Kobe about once a week to deal with refugees and their issues, and he created like this office in Yokohama where he dealt you know dealt with uh, you know visa issues and government issues and trying to get people to Palestine United States and other countries and you know basically taking over where he had left off when he was in Kovna and Gutfried arrives and he goes to his old friend Varaftig and says how can I help you and Varaftig says yes I could use your help and the first thing that Gutfried does is he helped him um, send all kinds of telegrams. And the fact that he had to forge telegrams for him, um, it was, you know, talking about a very, very challenging situation, trying to um, assist refugees in, in dire straits with nowhere to go and running out of funds, and 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 they were pretty desperate. And sometimes they had to forge telegrams to different organizations or countries or embassies or individuals. And and Var, and Gutfried testifies that he did that for Varaftig. But there's a big story that took place in March 1941, a fascinating story. And this brings us back once again to the visa story. Um, there's a boat with 74 Jewish refugees, primarily Polish re- Jewish refugees, who they're arriving. He said it's probably Akasazuza Maru, that, that boat that I spoke about uh, last time, um, um, and uh, or one of the other boats. And they had, the Jews on this boat had Japanese transit visas, so that they were good, but they did not have Curacao so-called end visas. So you can't have a transit visa unless there's an end visa. And these people had somehow gotten the Sugihara visas, but they had not been able to get the Dutch uh, and uh, Curacao visas. So they're in trouble. And they were going to be sent back to Vladivostok, to the Soviet Union. And presumably they were going to be sent back to Siberia. Now remember... Even though this is in, this is already March 1941, this is still before the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union. So it's before any mass shootings take place. It's before the final solution takes place. Still the greatest fear is the Soviet Union. And, there's, they're, and they're, they're being going to be sent to Vladivostok, which is far away from the Nazis, but it's in the terrible Soviet Union, and that's where they're trying to get away from. And they're scared that if they get sent back to the Soviet Union, then... They're going to be being accused of spies and counter-revolutionaries and be bounced off to Siberia. So they're terrified because they don't have their Karasau uh, visas. So Varavtig finds out about it. He asks Gutfeert, can he help? Because it's a three-day boat journey back to Vladivostok. They already left the port at Tsuriga in Japan and they were being sent back. They're already on their way back. That's it. They returned back from Japan. They were not allowed to dock and come out at the port. The 74 refugees are at risk of being sent to Siberia, and they have only three days to act. So Gutwirt goes to the Dutch consul in Kobe, and here's another unknown hero of our story, Nicholas de Vood. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. It's V-O-O-G-D. I think it's pronounced de Vood or de Vood, uh, something along those lines. And... And he only has three days. He had never met Divud before. And he comes to him and he says, can you, can you provide them with the Curacao visas? All these people have 
Japanese transit visas, all they need is... The, and he's like, Curacao visas? What are you talking about? It's the governor gives permission. So he says, yeah, but you can do it. And he starts telling him the whole story. You can write on it, no visa needed for Curacao, and leave out the second part uh, of, of you need the governor permission, just like we did back in, in Kovna. And he tells, and Gutfried tells him the whole story. So Divut says, I'm only the consul in Koba. The ambassador, the Dutch ambassador, is in Tokyo, and I need permission for him. Now, that was too risky. Why? Because, first of all, he might not give permission. And second of all, it will take too long. They only have three days. So Gutfried said to him, look, 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 let me show you that I have this letter from the Dutch ambassador in Riga, de Decker, who sent me a letter. This is all um, Gutfried's testimony. So he said this himself. I heard the story on his video testimony himself. Um, so Gutfried shows him de Decker's letter, the original letter that de Decker had sent to Gutfried that allowed for this whole process to start off a year, uh, not a year earlier, several months earlier, half a year earlier, right? And he says, look, the Dutch ambassador to Riga said it's fine. That means that the Dutch government authorizes it. So you just go ahead and do it. Now, Nicholas Divud, who was not authorized by the Dutch ambassador to Tokyo, was not authorized by the Dutch government in exile in London, he said, you know what? This letter from the ambassador de Decker to you half a year ago, in, the ambassador in Riga, that's enough for me. I'll do it. And that was a huge, heroic, and very courageous move by Nicholas Divoud. Not only that, but that afternoon, um, Divoud was leaving the embassy, the office for his private home for a three-day holiday, uh, a religious holiday, some Christian, whatever, not, you know, Dutch, Christian, I don't know, some sort of holiday. I don't know what holidays there is in March 1941, but I'm not Dutch or Christian. So, so what's he going to do? The, off, the offices of the embassy are going to be closed, and the embassy and the and and the uh, and Divut is going home. So Divut says to him, and again, he didn't have to do this. He's they don't have any time to wait. It's a three day holiday, but it's also three days till the the boat arrives back. He gives Gutvert stationery from the Dutch consul and says, go have it typed up, what you just told me from the Decker. Have that thing about Curacao typed up, that you don't need a visa to Curacao. And then come to my private residence, and I'll give you my address on my holiday, and I'll just sign them all. Sign 74 of, of these papers. Um, so that was, I mean, that was incredible. Uh, um, Gutfried said this, I mean, he was an angel. He was, it, was, it was like no reason that he should have done that and should have acquiesced to this and offered be so generous with it. And um, and they went ahead and did it. Gutfried brought it back to Varaftig, and he did all the 74 papers, and they typed it up. And they he runs to his house, and he, uh, and he, uh, and he, gets, him, he gets them signed. And it was, you know, I, I, th- I believe that Gutfried said that the Amshan of a Rebbe was one of the 74 on that boat, and others... Um, maybe even Benny Fischoff, I'm not sure. Uh, there was other other people on that boat. It was 74 Jews. Um, the names are less important. They were able to send a telegram or a radio message, I guess, to the captain of that ship that they have the Curacao visas and they're waiting for them in the Japanese port. And the captain was able to turn around. And the captain turned around and brought them back, which is another thing. The Japanese sea captain did bring them back, which is also pretty incredible on his part. And him, I don't know his name. Um, so, uh, so the uh, Gutfried said, why, asked Divud, he said, why are you, why are you doing this? And he had gone, he went to his house with with Leo Sternheim, by the way, with that other fellow, that other Dutch fellow who I mentioned before. Um, uh, he said, why are you, why are you going, why are you doing this? So he said, people are in danger. It's not a bother. There's there's no reason not to do it. Um, so it was a great deed that Divud did. He could have been punished. Um, because he was going against uh, the ambassador in Tokyo without his authorization. He could have been reprimanded. And he saved these 74 Jews from possible deportation to Siberia and perhaps even their lives. Um, so, the interesting, the mirror was, either there were some mirrors in those 74, or maybe they were helped in some other way, but the mirror felt they owed a debt of gratitude to Divud, and there was... The Mir actually put out a mourning notice, a moda'at evil, it's called in Israel, uh, a notice of mourning um, when Divud died, I think in the 70s or even 80s, maybe even later, I don't remember what year he died. Um, the Mir Yeshiv in Yerushalayim put out in, 
in in Dutch in in, in, in Dutch newspaper or where, or however it works over there a you know a notice from the mirror that they uh, you know it's ter- this great man who helped us out and during our time in Japan um, died and you know was a great sadik so that's uh, that's another story that's that's important to to note um, so now we bring them to Shanghai. Um, and like I said, it's the end of the summer and the beginning of uh, the, the beginning of, uh, of, of, of the, of, the um, of, of, of fall, I guess, L time around that they, most of the refugees arrive in Shanghai. And it's a few thousand, it's about 5,000 refugees, Polish Jewish refugees who arrive in Shanghai. And, um, and there's two things I want to end off with. Uh, in in this episode about their going to Shanghai, and we'll take we'll pick it up from there. We'll leave it as like, you know, just to keep our appetites wet for the next episode, which I hope will be the final one, which will briefly discuss their time in Shanghai. So the two points that I want to make is first of all, I mentioned that some of them were able to make it to the United States, and only well, only those who were able to not make it to the United States or another country were deported to Shanghai essentially by the Japanese. Um, the Japanese controlled Shanghai, they controlled that whole area of China, and um, Shanghai was this international city. They had the Chinese section of Shanghai, which was, you know, terrible, poor, and everything, and then there was the um, French uh, section of Shanghai, and the British section of Shanghai, and then there was the international area of Shanghai, and the refugees were dumped in the international section. That's where they lived during the time of Shanghai, but I'll get more into that hopefully next time, where they lived and how they lived there. And eventually, in 1943, the, the Japanese, under pressure from their, their Nazi allies, established a Shanghai ghetto, which wasn't a, an exciting place to be at all. But either way, uh, uh, um, the, point, the point I'm trying to make is that only those who were not able to make it to another country were sent to Shanghai, and there were a few thousand of them. Now, there was a group of Mir Yeshiva students, about 22 um, students who did have the possibility of getting to the United States just around the time that the Japanese were sending the yeshiva to the, the refugees, including the yeshiva to Shanghai. One of those was Rebleib Malin. And he and his 22 friends, they decided to, in, despite the fact that they could have gone to the United States, they choose to not take their visas to the United States and go with the rest of the yeshiva to Shanghai, which is an absolutely astounding move. I, I mean, this decision... To, it cost him five years of his life, the, him and his friends, just to remain with the yeshiva. And he writes in a letter that we have uh, his thinking. Now, the, the, I translated this le- part of parts of this letter for um, the Mishpacha magazine article Davi Safir and I wrote a few years ago about Rebbe Malin. So I'm going to read from my translation. I hope my translation does justice because he obviously wrote it in Hebrew. Um, so I'm going to read a, just two paragraphs from that letter, which explains Rebbe Malin's thinking. And it, I think it really, really is an insight into how he saw things at this time. So here's the quote from his letter. Uh, the primary reason that we will not be traveling to the U- U.S. at this time is because for all of us who received the visas to the United States, our souls are bound with the souls of all the Bnei HaYeshiva. Our goals and aspirations are to be constantly in the company of our Yeshiva in its entirety. It is difficult for us to separate from the rest of the Holy Yeshiva. It is therefore inconceivable for a significant group, significant group to depart on Erev Yom Kippur, a time when everyone should be gathering together to bask in the presence of the Yeshiva on the holiest day of the year. It would be detrimental for the Talmudim who were left behind, as well as against our own nature, which is accustomed to being part of the Yeshiva at all times, and especially on such an auspicious day. It is for this reason that we have decided to eschew the use of our visas at this juncture, and we hope that there will be a future opportunity. It is very important to, to, to us to travel together. In this way, we will be a joint foundation for the future edifice, and we will strengthen, strengthen each other in Torah and Yira through our shared efforts. Whereas if we were to disperse, then perhaps some individuals won't be able to hold their own without the group. And really, this this is Rebbe Malin. This is him... Um, you know, the, the yeshiva remains together. The yeshiva blights the zaman. Um, we, you know, the, the tzuresa yeshiva and not separating. And that's what the strength of the mir was. And, and he went and sacrificed. And he, uh, and he explained this in this letter to Aron Kalmanovich, why he was not using the visa to the United States. And that's what they did. Um, the last thing that I'll say is they arrive in Shanghai. And I've heard, I've heard this so many times that I feel like even I... No, I think most people know this, but I still hear on trips uh, and and, uh, and my lectures and other times, 
people still get this confused, so I want to just make it clear. Many people talk about the mir in Shanghai. So the mir is 300 people. The mir is a part of a group of about 5,000 Polish Jewish refugees who are in Shanghai, who are sent to Shanghai from Japan at this time. But they, this whole entire 5,000 group is only a tiny minority of the Shanghai Jewish community at this time. Why? Because there are about 15,000 German or German speaking, because many of them are Austrian, Viennese Jews. In fact, most of them are probably Viennese Jews, but German and Austrian Jews who had arrived in Shanghai. They're also refugees, and they had arrived in Shanghai in the late 1930s, primarily after Kristallnacht. And they arrived in Shanghai because those were just one of the places that they ended up going. The, you know, the Viennese consul in the the, Jap- the Chinese, excuse me, the Chinese consul in Vienna, Feng Shengho, he assisted Jewish refugees escaping after Kristallnacht, including my own wife's grandmother um, and her family and many many others. So the the um, the there's fifteen thousand. So they're three times the size, and they're also a refugee Jewish community. But they also weren't the only community. There were two native communities. We have two refugee communities and two native communities. We have the Polish Jewish refugees, which are about 5,000 people. We have the German-speaking Jewish refugees from Germany and Austria, which are about 15,000 Jews. And then we have two native Jewish communities. We have the Russian Jewish community, which came from the late 1800s and more so after the Kishinev pogrom in 1903, and then even more so after the Russian Revolution in 1917, Jews escaping, many religious Jews. So Russian Jews, thousands of Russian Jews settle in Shanghai. Large Jewish community, large, uh, with a, it's a famous rav, Rabbi Ashkenazi, and Jewish institutions, and yeshivas, and schools, and girls' schools, and, and shuls, and, and, and kosher food, and, and everything. A big, you know, a burgeoning Jewish community, religious, secular, whatever you want, politics, everything. Um Ashkenazi's Russian Jewish community. And then there's, they came in the early 1900s, I'm working backwards. The original, original Shanghai Jewish community was Sephardic Jews who followed the British trade routes, wealthy Iraqi Baghdad Jews who, came, who followed the British Empire's trade routes from Iraq to, to India, the British Empire in India, they settled primarily in Calcutta, but also in what was then Bombay, today Mumbai, and other parts of India. And they became extremely wealthy in commerce and in investments, real estate, and all kinds of other trade in the British Empire. And then from India, many of them, Im- many of them immigrated even further east to Shanghai and developed a lot of the Chinese economy in Shanghai and British influence around the time of the Boxer Rebellion. I'm not going to get into, in, in, into all that, but the Sassoons and the Hardoons and the, and the Abrahams and all these incredibly wealthy. They were from the wealthiest people, not just Jews, wealthiest people in all of Asia. Phenomenal wealth. And it was a much smaller Jewish community, unfortunately quite assimilated, much intermarriage there with, with, with Europeans and Chinese. Um, but some of them remained religious. There were shuls, there were Sephardic shuls, and there was... Um, you know, they remained loyal to their Baghdadi uh, roots, um, some of them. Others assimilated. All of them were wealthy, and there was a, quite a flourishing community. So you have the Sephardic, well, they were smaller, probably a few hundred families. So there's the Sephardic community. They came in the mid-1800s to the late 1800s. There's the Russian Jewish community that came in the early 1900s. And then there's the German um, uh, uh, Jewish community who are refugees. They came in the late 1930s, uh, Germans and Austrians, Viennese Jews. And then there's the Polish Jewish refugees. Of the last fourth Jewish community in Shanghai, which number about 5,000 people in this massive community of tens of thousands of Jews, 300 members of that community was the Mir Yeshiva. So it's not exactly the Mir's in Shanghai, it's the mirror is part of a much larger story of Shanghai Jewry. And it just, as much as I love the mirror, and I'm a mirror, but it's important to just put it in the proper context. I think that what I said is well known, but I just, just fleshed it out just in case um, it needs to be uh, so. So we're going to take it up from here next time in what I hope will be the final episode, the grand finale of this series. And we'll talk about the years in Shanghai once they already arrived there. This is Yehuda Geber with Jewish History Soundbites. You can reach me at Yehuda at Yehudageber.com for questions, comments, sources, tours, trips, sponsorships, and lectures. You can subscribe to Jewish History Soundbites on your favorite podcast platform, and I hope you enjoyed.